Um, in the previous session, we started talking about the uh, the uh, uh, the Torah reading in the Sephardic synagogue, and I'm talking about certain differences in the interaction between the people in the in the synagogue. So I think it has to do with the culture in general. The uh, and that is that in the Sephardic culture, the Middle East, North Africa, and um, and Spain also, the uh, the interpersonal uh, relationships are very, are encouraged. People uh, usually uh, shake hands or or give each other a hug uh, or kiss each other on the cheek. It's very common in the Middle East and North Africa. In some synagogues where I went, uh, in the Iraqi synagogue, they didn't do that. Um, they would be like uh, handshaking or something like that. Uh, in the Syrian synagogue, a kiss on the cheek, but only one side. In the Moroccan synagogue, on both cheeks. Um, and yeah, it's it's a little. Uh, I, we had there was someone who was just started coming to our synagogue uh, recently, and I asked him. Um, so how do you how do you feel about this? Were you embraced by the people? He said too much. <laughs> I'm not used to that. I got he says I got more hugs this week than I got my whole life, um, but eventually got used to it. So this is something that that uh, you will see in a Sephardic synagogue. Yeah, also, in some places, the when when you walk into the synagogue, especially on Shabbat morning, um, people would would greet each other. They would either. Uh, go to each one and shake his hand and and or give a hug and a kiss, or just acknowledge with the motion. You know, uh, motion similar to the way you you use in ASL to say thank you. It's like bringing your hand from your forehead to your chest. It's like I I saw you and I acknowledge you. I say hello to you. Uh, by contrast, I went to some Ashkenazi synagogues on Shabbat. Uh, traditional Orthodox synagogues, um, and in some cases, even it was part of a family family affair. Um, one of my children got married into an Ashkenazi family, and we all prayed together in our own minyan. So everybody, the all all the people in the minyan were our people, right? my family and their family. And I came in uh, among one of the first to be there, and all the other people who came in, who were relatives of the bride, just came in and sat in there, took their place. And sort of like, we're in their bubble. And I was like, hello, I'm here. Like, uh, what is going on? Since so you say goodbye, you say hello. So um, there is a sort of a, uh, a foundation for this for this approach in halakha, but it's completely misunderstood. The uh, Based on a verse in in Mishlei, Mevarech re'ayu bekol gadol baboker ashkem kelalate hashev lo. says, he who uh, greets his his friend with a loud with a loud voice early in the morning, um, his friend doesn't appreciate it. To him, it is considered more of a of a curse. Um, well, I, I would, I'll show you this verse one. So here is the the verse in uh, in Mishle it says this. Uh, one second. Here, uh, what is that? Here, Mevarech Raya. It's on chapter twenty-seven, verse fourteen of Proverbs. Mevarech Raya bekol gadol baboker Ashkem klala tehashev lo. You say if you greet your friend out loudly early in the morning, it is more a curse than a blessing. Now the original meaning of the text was that uh, sometimes people want discretion and they need quiet. If someone, if you see someone leaving the house early in the morning and maybe trying to get to his field before anyone else or to the market to beat early traffic and say, hi, how are you? What are you doing? And then, you know, or, uh, and then you stop him for a talk. It's the, the other guy is not happy with that. You know, right now we just let me go and, and do what I need to do. Um, meaning the, the 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 meaning of the verse originally was, uh, even when you want to greet someone, take take care to uh, try to understand where they are and who they are. Right? It's, it makes sense. Uh, 
The rabbis, though, took it to a different direction, and they said that if you go out of your way to say, to greet your friend in the morning before you go to prayers, then that blessing is not a blessing, is a curse, because the first thing you have to do is to thank God and not to go about your social business, which, okay, has it has it has a value, but the rabbis, because of that, some people develop the practice of when they go to the synagogue, they don't greet anyone. Because the halacha says you cannot greet anyone until you you pray, and until you greet God, sort of. But that is misunderstanding the halacha. What the halacha was saying is if you go if you go out of your way, and you first engage in social social interaction. Maybe you go have a coffee with your friends and give idle talk, and then you go to the synagogue. This is inappropriate. But if the first thing you do, you come to the synagogue, and there, that is the place where you greet people. Of course, not only it's allowed, it's encouraged. Uh, that's how you build a community. So this is very common um, in in the Sephardic communities. Uh, but even within the Sephardic communities, the more Orthodox they become or they are, the less such interaction is encouraged. Um, and actually, Rabbi Ovadia Yosef went to war against the Moroccan uh, community for kissing people in the synagogue. He said, we have a rule, you don't show affection in the synagogue. Um, I don't know if you ever heard of that. Did you hear of, of this rule? Okay, so uh, the, apparently there are some people who took that very seriously, and they said that one cannot show affection, just as I said now, you know, that some people show affection to uh, to, to their peers in the synagogue. Uh, there's also the question of showing affection to children in the synagogue. And that really has become an issue that I think could, could uh, uh, make or break a synagogue. Um, the The question of how you, how you treat children in the synagogue... Uh, with patience, with love, with respect? Do you want them to make the, the feel that they're happy there or not? So someone came up with the notion, and we could track, we could track it into halakha uh, to see where it came from, and said that you're not allowed to show affection to your children in the synagogue. That to, to hug or kiss your child in the synagogue shows that you don't love God enough. And therefore, you should not show them affection in the synagogue. Now, to me, this is not only wrong, it's destructive. Why? Because in the child's mind, let's say that this child has a father who loves him dearly and kisses and hugs him and and does that, right? Uh, And shows affection on a regular basis. And then the kid, that child, identifies a pattern. It says, my dad loves me dearly, but there is a certain uh, time and place where he doesn't show me love. When I tried to get to him and he wouldn't kiss me, he wouldn't touch me, uh, where is that? The synagogue. So the synagogue is a place where my dad doesn't love me. That is the negative and destructive uh, impact of that of that uh, halacha, of that practice. Now where does it come from? It's important to know where it comes from, because that is another uh, uh, completely new field of difference <clears throat> between Ashkenazi and, and Sephardim, although it had been eroded in the last 500 years. And that is the question of how we deal with Midrash, how we deal with the Midrashic interpretation of the Torah. There's a whole, uh, I taught a whole seminar on that at AJR, and it's online, it's on Spreaker, under the rubric Midrash, so you can see uh, the development of Midrash and all that. But I'll take this one story that is a Midrashic story that people took literally, and because of that came up with this halacha. And that is, during the encounter of Yaakov with Yosef, after he has not seen him for more than 20 years, the, the Torah says that Yaakov... Um, Yosef went to greet his father and um, he met him in Goshen and when he met him he showed himself to him 
and he kissed him, and uh, let, me, let me show it to you in the, in, uh, the Mechon Mamre edition. One second. Um, it says, Vayera elav, vayipol al tzavarav, vayevka al tzavarav od. So, um, it tells us that Yosef showed himself to his father. When I want to show you the, the text. Um, so, do you remember, do you recall any anomaly in this in this story, in this pasuk? Here. Uh, we look at, in Bereshit, it's in Genesis, chapter 42, I believe. No, 43. Mm. Okay. Uh, here. Um, so, we see in chapter 46, chapter 46, verse 29, um, uh, ויסור יוסף מרכבתו, ויער לקראת ישראל אביו, גושנה וירא אליו, ויפול על צווריו, ויבקע על צווריו עוד. So, what, let me read here the text. Um, and Joseph made ready his chariot, and went up to meet Israel his father, to Goshen, and he presented himself unto him, and fell on his neck, and wept on his neck a good while. So what is missing from the Pasuk, if you know the context of the story, Yaakov longing for Yosef, mourning, uh, mourning him, praying for him, whatever, what is missing here? Yaakov, Yaakov is missing. Yosef made ready his chariot. Yosef went up to meet his father. Yosef presented himself. Yosef fell on his neck. Yosef wept on his neck. What about Israel, his father? He said, now let me die, since I have seen thy face, that you are yet alive. And the question is, what was Yaakov doing? Why didn't he hug his son? Why didn't he weep over his uh, shoulders? So the conclusion, which is a, it's a Midrashi conclusion, one of the Midrashim says, Yaakov at that time was reading the Shema, was reading Kiryat Shema. And... The obvious question is, what, what What do you mean he's reading the Shema? Is he praying? Is it prayer time? Could he not read the Shema earlier, before he met Yosef? He had to wait for the last minute to read it? So the answer was that uh, that is a an interpretation of the Midrash. The answer was that, um, the answer that suggested, was suggested is that Yaakov felt such love to his son Yosef, and he was afraid that the son, for his love, is going to trump his love for God. And therefore, he withheld his love, he controlled his love for his son, and instead read the Shema, to show how much he loves God. It's a very, uh, uh, to me, I don't know, say, hard to accept philosophical interpretation of that inter- of, of this whole situation. And it still doesn't solve the problem, because even if Yaakov fell that way, and he first wanted to show his love to Hashem, to God, the next thing that he could have done was to kiss and hug Yosef, which he didn't do. So there's something deeper there. But no matter how you look at the Pasuk, with the, I'll explain the, 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 the meaning of the Pasuk in a second, the uh, some halachic authorities looked at this midrash and this interpretation and said, you, "When you read the Shema, you cannot hug your son. When you're in the synagogue, you cannot hug your child or kiss your child." And therefore, uh, they came up with this mentality of kids in the synagogue should sit quietly and not move, and uh, and should, they should not be shown any affection. <clears throat> so that for the child, like I said, the the, the synagogue comes this. Uh, dreary dr- or dreadful place that where they don't want to go. Um, I tell to, I tell parents if you really feel that you don't want to show affection to your child in the synagogue, but you still love him dearly, it's better that you don't come. Stay outside, pray in the hallway, and 
pay attention to him. And and it's still common, even with parents who do show affection, you will see a parent who is doing the Amidah, the father is reading the Amidah, where you cannot move and you cannot talk, right? And the child is running and crying, and then the, the, the parent, the, the father gets upset at him, or he tries to pick him up, and the kid cries, kid cries in his, his arms. And I will tell the parents, this is not what you do. If you care about the child, during the Amidah, walk with the child outside, sit with him, tell him his story, bring him to the synagogue, but tell him his story, talk to him about the prayer, read with him a section, of, you don't have to read everything. If you already brought the child, make sure that this experience is the best experience that the kid can have. So we remember the synagogue with uh, with a positive light. So I want to go one one second back to the pasuk and talk about midrash also in general and you know in general terms. The approach among Sephardic scholars, we could say up until almost the 1400s, among all of them, the 14th century, uh, actually was that Midrash should not be taken literally. The Midrash is just one more type of commentary on the Torah. It is said by Maimonides, by Nahmanides, by Ibn Ezra, by Rav Hai Gaon, Rav, many, many great uh, Sephardic scholars. Uh, whereas in the Ashkenazi world, the, the Midrash was consecrated and became sacred literature in the to the extent that if you question the words of the midrash, you are a heretic. So that is one thing which is uh, an ideology that is different between the Sephardic and the Ashkenazi world. Um, and regarding the pasuk itself, <clears throat> this is part of my understanding of the text. I just want to to uh, to explain it since I brought up the problem. I don't want to leave it unsolved. Um, according to my reading of the story of Yaakov and Yosef. I think that Yaakov held a grudge against Yosef. Even though he was he was mourning for him and he was waiting for him to come back, but when he found out that for the last seven years, or the last nine years actually, his son was the viceroy of Egypt, he was extremely upset because he he said to himself and he also said it to Yosef, I've been dying every day a hundred times over because I thought that you were dead. And you had the ability to inform me that you're alive and you didn't do that. How could you do this to me? So he's the, he doesn't want to hug him. Yaakov, the closure that Yaakov needed was not to hug Yosef, but to know that Yosef is alive. And that's what he tells him the very next verse. He says, look what he tells him. Israel said unto Yosef, Now let me die, since I have seen your face, that you are yet alive. He should have said, Now I can live because I know you're alive. No, he says, Now I can die. I don't I have no no uh point in living. I just want now that I know that you're alive, I can die. And here's another proof that this is how Yaakov felt. Um if you go to chapter forty seven, where Yosef present his father, introduces his father to Paro, Pharaoh asks Yaakov, is here, it's chapter 47, verse 8, and Pharaoh said unto Yaakov, how many are the days of the years of your life? And Yaakov said unto Pharaoh, the days of the years of my sojournings are 130 years. Few and evil have been the days of the years of my life. They have not attained unto the days of the years of the life of my father, and you you read this and you say, really, Yaakov, you're kvetching now? And that's not the time to complain. The monarch brought you over, he offers you the land, he gives you the land of Goshen, he sends you, he says, oh, you can have all the abundance, everything you want. All he said is, how old are you? And now you say, I've been suffering, I had a miserable life, now you're becoming Yiddish imam. This is not this is not the time to do that. And the answer is, he's not telling it to Paro. He's talking to Yosef. Whether it was through a translator, most probably it was through a translator. So the way it, ro- it, it, it turned out, y- y- Yosef tells his father, Dad, he's asking, how old are you? And Yaakov says, well, tell him that my life was miserable. I never had any joy. Um, and he's saying, because of you, because of what you did to me. And Yosef probably turned to Paro and he said, he loves it here, thank you so much. Uh, 
But but here's there's the proof. I think this is what was going on. But it was misinterpreted as Yaakov was reading the Shema, and since Yaakov was reading the Shema, you don't show affection to children and, and so on. Um, so here, let's go back to this to this question of of the synagogue and what happens with the children. Um, another practice common in Sephardic synagogues, and I've heard that it is now adopted by uh, by Ashkenazi synagogues as well is the practice of throwing candies. Yes, have you seen that in Ashkenazi synagogues now? People do that? Okay. Um, in one of the synagogues in my area, they decided to introduce it in an Ashkenazi synagogue, but the 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 manual that was sent to the community of how to handle the candies were so com- complex, it was like, uh, you know, handling uh, uh, hazardous material. The candies should only be thrown between this segment and this segment only by a signal given by the rabbi and the gabai. Kids should not run in the aisles to pick up the candies. So they, you know what, you're better off not throwing the candies. Uh, if you're going to have like riot police there controlling the kids, collecting the candies. The whole idea of throwing candies is that there is, it's like disruptive technology. It's the disruptive uh, uh, joy during the services you read the Torah, everybody's focused, everybody's listening. But then the the Aliyah is over, the person receives his blessing, and he goes down, and everybody throws candies at him, and all the kids run and collect the candies, and it's just the unleashes joy in the synagogue. That's what you have to have. And in some, I'm sure you've you've heard the ululations. You know what they are? They are uh, uh, sort of like, what? Right, that everybody this gives another air of 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 excitement there um, in the synagogue, and it's I think it's beautiful. Um, <clears throat> so that is uh, it, it. It to me, it's a uh, it's a blessing to see that that uh, Sephardic and Ashkenazi synagogues communities are learning from each other. The uh, Ashkenazi synagogues learn to incorporate more. Uh, ideas like you know, throwing candies and, and singing and the Sephardic synagogue learn to maybe eliminate the, the, the auctions and the fundraising that is done and done is done in in uh, in such a manner. Uh, another thing that is done in the Sephardic synagogues, uh, and that is not only a practice but it is well documented and uh, uh, and and printed is that people who go up if people who receive an aliyah for a special occasion are honored with a song, with a special poem. And there are pieces of liturgy written specifically, for example, during Simha Torah, when we conclude the reading of the Torah, there's a special song for the Kohen, for the Levi, for the person who reads the blessing of Yosef, for the person who reads the, the section that starts with the word Me'ona, for the one who accomplishes the reading of the Torah, and for the one who starts the reading of the Bereshit, and to, for the one who reads Maftir. There's a special song for the father of a girl, and for the father of a newborn uh, uh, a boy. Uh, a, a song for the, the the groom, a song for the uh, for the uh, when it's uh, engagement, and so on and so forth. Everybody gets a blessing. In some places, even someone who was ill and recovered and comes to the synagogue, uh, there's a special song that speaks about healing, Refat Siri El Neeman, and it is sung in the in in the during the Aliyah, and um, that also adds another element of excitement and of of joy uh, to the tefillah, and uh, that is uh, that is done during Kriyat Torah. So sometimes the cantor does it, sometimes people from the congregation will do it, um, sometimes it will be just. Uh, some uh, uh, I've seen this happening. Someone who's been missing for the synagogue for was traveling, whatever, and is everybody likes him, and he goes up to the Torah, and all of a sudden they start singing something like Habibi, Habibi, which is like my beloved. I will come back. Um, so, uh, so here's another interesting uh, practice that has to do with Kiyada Torah, and that is that when you have a uh, groom in the synagogue. What is called in the Ashka in the Sephardic tradition is called Shabbat Hatam, <coughs> the Shabbat of the groom. In the Ashkenazi tradition, it's called Oifruf. 
the the difference between them is that the Sephardim celebrate the Shabbat for the bride and groom after the wedding, and the Ashkenazim celebrate it before the wedding. Now, in some Sephardic synagogues, mainly uh, what I know is the Syrian tradition and the North African, the the groom is honored with a special reading from the story of the uh, Avraham, when Avraham sent his servant to find a, a wife for his hawk. So the the text starts with the Avraham zaken ba bayamim vadunai berachet Avraham bakol. Now Avraham was old, coming of age, and he was blessed with everything. And he told his servant, "Please find a wife for my son, and God will be with you, and you will find a wife." As of course, it's appropriate for the bride and groom. In the Syrian community, the way it's done is that after the Hatan receives an aliyah, the the reader or the rabbi reads a verse from the Torah in the Hebrew, and the uh, another person, the Gabai or the Cantor, repeats the same verse in Aramaic. That reflects the old tradition from the time of the Mishnah, when they used to read the Torah in Hebrew and translate it to Aramaic. Um, that is the Syrian tradition. The North African tradition, in some, not, not all synagogues, uh, there would be a special Sefer Torah taken out for the groom. Now, usually we take out two, 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 two Torahs when, the, when it's a holiday, right? The reading of Pesach or Hanukkah or Shavuot uh, or the special four Shabbatot that come before Pesach. But in the in those communities, they would take out a Sefer Torah, especially for the groom. And when he goes up, when he gives, receives an Aliyah, he doesn't read from the regular Sefer Torah, but only only from that Sefer Torah. And maybe that was a practice that made it easy for the groom to prepare his reading, because they knew that all grooms would read the same thing. Um, and that, of course, was also a cause for celebration and throwing candies and so on. Um, so that is the uh, that is the reading of uh, uh, of the Torah. The Sefer is being brought back, Musaf, and all that. Uh, <clears throat> um, other other significant differences that we have uh, in the prayers um, that is the Shabbat prayer. The uh, the when we look at the uh, Rosh Hashanah and Kippur and the holidays are more or less the the. The differences and similarities are like on Shabbat. Uh, on Rosh Hashanah in Kippur, there is there are uh, several significant differences. One is that the Sephardic liturgy for Rosh Hashanah is uh, is solemn, yet less, I would say, less lugubrious, less depressing than the traditional Ashkenazi. Uh, prayer. I have a feeling from what I've heard that uh, Rosh Hashanah and uh, and the Selihot in the Ashkenazi community was a time where all uh, a lot of sorrow was channeled and and, uh, Jews who lived in Europe suffered uh, persecutions and pogroms and alienation that was much more severe than Jews who lived in uh, Islamic countries, and maybe that's why it's displayed uh, during those tefillot. Whereas in the uh, in the Sephardic tradition, you listen to the to some of the tunes of the Selihot, <clears throat> and you say that doesn't sound like Selihot, but still people feel the the idea, you know, the uh, the atmosphere of of Selihot of Rosh Hashanah. For example, the famous Adona Selihot. Did I mention that before? Ah, don't. That's right. It's very. Uh, sort of, it sounds like a light tune. Everybody sings together. The master of forgiveness, <coughs> Bore, Bohen Levavot. He who examines or knows what's in our heart. He who unveils the deep secrets. So, but, but you you say you say such uh, reverence, such praise, and you sing.
it sounds a little like, uh, you know, even joyous, but that is a characteristic of the of the Sephardic Selimot. Um The uh, and even even on Yom Kippur, there are parts where very solemn, where where the the reading is plaintive, and uh, and I remember when I would hear my cantor when I was a kid reading those parts, everybody was crying. Um, he would he would. Uh, Chant them in a very, uh, very sad voice, and prov- you know, invoke any, everyone, you know, into crying. Um, for example, when he would read, there's a part called Viduya Gadol Shal Rabenu Nisim. It's a it's a confession composed by Rabenu Nisim, was a Rosh Hashiva, the head of the Shiva in Bavel, and where he says, uh, "If you God are going to judge me according to my deeds." Woe to me, woe to my soul. If I do not take a masai, oili ahali aha al nafshi, the cantor would read that in that in the following tune. It was really it would put you in the mood of uh, of of despair. Like who am I? And it would go like, oili ahali. And even more than that, and I would hear people crying um, in the audience, and I would cry, I guess, sometimes at a certain age. Um, but then there are other parts of the tefillah on Yom Kippur, <clears throat> where everybody sings together, and it has again this very uplifting, very hopeful tune, like. Uh, I don't know if you ever heard that. Ya Shema Evionecha, Mahalim Apanecha. That's the opening for the Slihot at night <coughs> or the uh, prayer of the Ni'ila. El Nur Alila, El Nur Alila, Hamzila Numehila, Beshat Anila. It's very rhythmical, very melodic. People all sing it together. And the beauty of the tefillah at that time is that everybody sings together uh, uh, those prayers. So I have I prayed one year. I was forced to stay in the yeshiva and pray the high holy days um, with Ashkenazi tradition. And I, I, I didn't connect. I know that this is also, um, it's a question of upbringing. Whatever we grew up with, and in that special occasion, whether it's Kippur or Rosh Hashanah, um, we feel comfortable in the thing that in the in the um, setting that is most familiar, most similar to our tradition. But also <clears throat> regarding certain melodies, when I look at them uh, from the outside, I feel that there is more um, more hope in in the prayers there, and I, I think it's has to do with the uh, with the social, historical, religious context of Jews under Islam and Jews under Christianity. Um, that is uh, that is regarding the uh, the prayers of uh, of Yom Kippur. So let us touch briefly on some life cycle events, and next week we're going to return back to halacha. Um, so let's start from. The uh, the the birth of a baby boy and a baby girl. So uh, for a baby girl, for a newborn uh, girl, in uh, in the Sephardic tradition was to have, like I said, a special song sung for the father of the girl when he gets an aliyah to the Torah, and then um, they would have a service called Zeved Abat, the blessing of the daughter. <clears throat> not in the synagogue necessarily. It will be in the house of the family, and uh, they would, you know, make a festive meal, and everybody would gather there. Usually, they would wait a month or more for the mother to recover so she could be part of it. Um, and I know that in the Iraqi community, they used to uh, uh, to bring j- uh, jars or uh, or. Um, uh, planters filled with candies. Um, in more modern times, they would put popcorn. I know that after the discovery of corn in South America, they were able to do that and just break and, and throw them and break it on the ground and the kids would collect 
the uh, the candy, or and some would just spill them. But the idea of, of throwing them, of breaking them, maybe maybe it's to drive away the evil eye. The evil eye was something that is very uh, is is still present among many traditional families, Ashkenazi and Sephardim. Even though not many like to admit that, because around the the uh, the event of a birth of a new baby, everybody's afraid that something is going to happen to him. The uh, uh, there is a custom today of people gathering and reading Zohar, reading Kabbalistic text on the night before the the uh, the Brit of a baby boy. Um, that is actually a minhag that started in Germany. And it was uh, an influence of pagan rituals. The uh, the Germans, the pagan Germans, believed that witches come, uh, and uh, witches or demons can come and kidnap the child before it was uh, before it was named. And once they adapted Christianity, they believed that uh, the night before the baptism, when the baby is given a name. It's that child is still nameless, and therefore it could be uh, uh, possessed by the demons. So they would give that child a fake name, uh, and to mislead the the demons. That later on was adopted this practice by Ashkenazi Jews, who would uh, they had a uh, um, a practice called Schreiholz, meaning screaming with a with a with a bat with a with a club because they would wave uh clubs in the air and scream the name of the baby but it was not the real name it was a fake name a non-jewish name and on the following day during the Brit Milah they would give that child a Hebrew name and that's why many Ashkenazi Jews already from the 12th century on would carry two names the one uh and they would go together uh even when one is a translation of the of the uh, um, of the Hebrew, for example, uh, Arye Leib or uh, or uh, Shaga Feivel and, and stuff like that. But before that, they had uh, non-Jewish names completely in uh, given the night before. Through the Zohar and Kabbalah, it it was transformed also into the Sephardic world. But in the Sephardic world, <clears throat> there's no such thing of of giving another name, uh, a fake name before the 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 Brit. What is done is people gather and read the Zohar, read parts of the Kabbalah, and uh, and blessings sort of to uh, protect, to create a protection for the baby the night before the Mila. And that is still something that, by the way, even although I don't agree with the superstitions of demons, evil eye and all that, I do think that there is a value to the idea of a sacred space that is being... Uh, it's being created with prayer, with learning, with getting together. Just it has to be done with with understanding, and not just uh, rote reading. Um, during the Brit Milah, there are, there are many customs, I'm not going to mention all of them, but the idea of uh, kvoters, that people hand the baby from one to another, from a man to a woman, is an Ashkenazi custom, also with uh, roots in pagan traditions. Um, it didn't... Uh, we don't have something similar among the Sephardim. <clears throat> um, another interesting minhag uh, that we have. This is around Pidyon Aben uh, in the in the Sephardic community when the when there is a Pidyon, meaning that after thirty on the thirty first day after the birth of a baby boy, uh, it has to be exchanged with the Kohen, uh, following what is written in the Torah. So the Kohen would tell the mother of the child, Your ch- this child is mine, according to the Torah, uh, you have the option of redeeming it from me by paying five shekels, five coins of silver, or letting me keep the child. What do you want? And of course, uh, the mother would want to keep to, to have the child. But in the, in the Sephardic community, uh, before conducting this exchange, all the women would take off their jewelry and would pin it to the baby with safety pins. Uh, I don't know what they did before they had safety pins. It's like so scary. Uh, but they, so the idea is 
to raise the value of the child, right? You're now going to do an exchange, and this baby is covered with gold. Uh, when when we had our first, you know, uh, our first son, my wife and I, he had a pidion, and we did it in my parents' house, and they did that. We have pictures like of, of you know, my son, you know, with the gold all over. Uh, the funny thing that happened was that we couldn't find the owner of one of the pieces, and you no, know, it was it was very uh, uh, worrying, worrisome that you know we we may want to make sure that every eventually we found her. We everybody got what there what's what was theirs, but um, it was a cautionary tale that I tell people. You know, if when you do that, make sure that you document each piece of jewelry that goes on the baby. You know where it comes from. So that's a nice a nice custom around the uh, uh, the pidyon. Ah, also. Um, among the Iraqis, there's an interesting minhag. The night before the Brit Milah, they bring the the special chair called Kiseh Eliyahu, the chair of Eliyahu from the synagogue, and they tie around it uh, branches of uh, of uh, myrtle of hadas. And when they read the special reading that I mentioned, they also sing, etc. And that's an interesting development. This practice. Because it's it's in Arabic, it's called Aqd al Yas, the tying of the Yas. Yas is uh, myrtle in Arabic. Uh, and it's a wordplay because Il Yas is the myrtle, but also the Arabic name for Eliyahu, Elias. So that's what you have it. And finally, I'll touch one, uh, uh, two or three differences in the wedding. Um, I don't want to go into burial, there are so many different. Uh, Customs there, and among all communities, it is usually driven by fear and by superstition. Um, that we just kept adding layers to the uh, original halacha from the time of the Mishnah. But we'll talk about the wedding. Uh, the, the the Ashkenazi tradition is for the to the bride to go seven times around the groom. That's not a Sephardic minhag. We don't do that. When couples ask me to do that, and I will, I say, "You're welcome. It's your wedding. You do, you know, as you wish." And I think that the meaning of the of the minha of that, or the idea of this of practice is to build that sacred space around the bride and groom. It's nice, but we don't do that. Uh, <clears throat> the there is a minhag among some Ashkenazi communities that the groom wears a kittle. This is like the white robe. I don't know if you've ever seen that in a, at a wedding. Um, and th- that is part of, to me, of like the inability to just be happy. Come on. This is a, it's your, it's the wedding day, and they tell the the groom, you have to wear a kittle because you have to remember it's like Yom Kippur, uh, or you have to remember the day of death. You know, don't be too happy because you're going to die, and that's the kittle is like the shroud. Um the Sephardim don't do that. Obviously, the another minhag that uh, started in the Ashkenazi community and spread into the Sephardic, and I'm trying to tell people not to do it, is for the bride and groom to fast on the day of their wedding, because they believe that this some gives them some kind of spiritual elevation. I tell couples don't dare do that. You want you want to have the energy to be happy and 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 to dance to do whatever you want to do on the night of your wedding. If you want to fast, fast spiritually. And that's what I did before I got married. I did what is called Tani Dibu, a fast from idle talk. On the day of your wedding, avoid, instead of avoiding food, avoid idle talk. Just say what is necessary. And this way you can focus on the importance of the day. Um, and uh, I think, I mean, there are, there are many different uh, customs of wedding and, and other life cycles, but those I think are the most important. We'll touch maybe upon more when we when we go back to our uh, when we resume the re, the the study of halachot, which we're going to start to do next week, God willing, looking at uh, at the halachot of Rabbi Toledano, Rabbi Shalush, and bring maybe halachot also of those life cycles. So with this, we'll conclude today our session.